So welcome to the podcast, everybody. I'm Jason, that's John, that's Mitch, and this is Dave. And we're going to take a little bit of time here soon. I'll let Dave introduce himself, talk about who he is, uh, what his favorite stuffs are, and all of that on this episode of the Nerd Brand Podcast. So today we're talking tactical entrepreneurship and data-driven decisions. But first, Dave, I would like for you to introduce yourself, tell the folks who you are. Uh, Obviously, I should have said your full name, but I'll let you do that. (laughs) No worries at all. Well, firstly, thanks for inviting me on here. Uh, Super excited to to, to chat with you all and uh, tell the story and and, and talk entrepreneurship. It's a huge passion for me. Um, Yeah, my name is Dave Crothers. I'm the founder and CEO of a a company called VoxPotMe. We're a video survey platform um and i'll talk a little bit more about that in a second but maybe just give some background as to my entrepreneurial journey and how uh i ended up running a a a video survey company but um yeah so um always been fascinated by technology and entrepreneurship and business and the kind of combination of, of of all three uh didn't go a traditional route left school at 16 um, was fascinated by the internet. I mean, I think it's just, it, it's, it's the one thing that's really revolutionized the world and, and the access to knowledge that we all have and the access to content and the ability to le- want to learn anything and find an abundance of resource to kind of teach yourself that, whether you know it's some kind of random DIY thing, like making a table to learning the guitar to programming in some language to cryptocurrency like whatever it is I was just obsessed with just this kind of central hub of knowledge and then okay you know that business angle of like oh okay so how can we monetize this like what business models can can evolve from this so um from that kind of uh, an early age set up a Uh, tech company originally doing kind of you know support services you know exchange configuration all of that kind of hardware type type stuff and um, aged about 20 got into to web development and web design and was really fortunate to have uh, an opportunity to uh, build a platform that was similar to yelp.com before really yelp existed but it was franchised out so we created this business called the best of it was the best businesses in the town we sold it as a franchise and i remember being approached to build this business and the websites i built at that time were just like these tiny simple like you know static html terrible terrible sites and this is like before square and wix and wordpress and all these kind of crms and this guy said hey can you build the system and i you know said yeah sure went and bought a bunch of books and did a load of reading and in three months built from scratch like a full content management full platform where these the companies could manage all these business systems manage events do do everything from scratch and and um you know that was extremely successful it became the fastest um growing franchise in uk history we sold all this this these are things and did it on a revenue share basis so really took a leap of faith so at a pretty early age it, um, established some some success and and um yeah that really changed my career because over that time we went from you know, two of us with an idea to 50, 60 people. And I was manager team of 15 developers. I learned very quickly. There was a lot of people that were better at writing code than I was. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, just uh, went through that that whole whole transition and you know, learned a lot about SEO, online marketing, you know, conversion rate optimization. And, you know, just really played into what, like, I guess my nerd was, right? You know, it was like business and tech and marketing and like, how do you put all these things together? And just fascinated by the science behind the numbers, the, you know, just, you know, like the, the gamification of marketing, like excited me, you know, like how do I get my CPL lower today than it was yesterday? The AB test, you know, all of that stuff. So that really spoke to me. Um, fast forward on from there. I don't mean to interrupt. You may not know this, but everything you just said and described, and you may not be able to tell on video, but John's very happy. Cause that's yeah, I, I saw a little wry smile from him. I, I knew he was, uh, he was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I've, I've loved seeing the evolution. I mean, it's been, I got into to marketing, you know, been about 10 years and came in right when Pinterest and Twitter and all those places were really starting to become marketing channels, not just these things that we talk to our friends on. Um, and so to just kind of see, like you said, the gamification of marketing and reviews and, 
uh, surveying and things like that through digital digital methods was was really where I entered the my career. So it's it's been a strong passion since then. That's that's a nerd. There's there there it is. There. And I'll finish that up with the people jackhammering outside. <laughs> Yeah, not, big woodpeckers. That's not, a band, that's not a marching band outside of his house for those listening. Yeah, <laughs> that's a jack. We do have a full story sure, on that if you want to learn later. Um. Sure, sure sounded like a snare drum. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love the fact that 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 fits, Dave, with you and John and your all's and your all's nerd. Um, because I mean, you know, we, one of the questions we always ask anybody that ever comes on the show is like, you know, kind of what is your nerd? But then we always preface that with what's the Will Wheaton quote again, Mitch? Oh, lost it's audio. not what you love. It's how you love it. Yes. And that's, you know, I mean, you guys get excited about that as much as we get excited about what we love with Marvel comics, transformers, whatever it may be. I mean, you know, it's, to me, it's all it's what you're doing um i can see the passion with you dave when you're talking about it <laughs> like you know i really can and that i love that and you have to have that as an entrepreneur you like you have to have passion about it um uh, being in a being in web myself i'm not pro i'm not as savvy a web developer as you are um most of my development's been like front-end wordpress i mean i, I remember html pages and tables um i also remember the tables are great for cafes not not so much web pages now <laughs> but you know it's like I, I remember working with that and and that was my entry that was my gateway is making simple pages like you said you know and just kind of coding those and i think css came out what was it 2002 is when that language came out the style pages and mm -hmm. i got i cut my teeth on it in 2000 five i believe is when i really started messing with it doing a lot you know how you do in line in the code and everything and then mm -hmm. um wordpress for me i started that in 2008 started really diving into that and theming and everything and so um you know the world of web is just god it's just evolved so much there's so much out there saying you're a web developer is uh such a broad term people just think of all kinds of things and a lot of things that are not things that have to do with it um so I kind of curious, like, cause dev to dev, like what has been some of the, don't want to get it too involved into it, but the client from hell stories, you know, are you familiar with that blog on Tumblr clients from hell? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you uh, have a favorite? Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, there was, there was, I don't know what it is, but it was basically like a back and forwards between a guy and it had, I'll have to dig it out for you guys and share it with you, but it's basically a load of graphs and charts about like the likelihood of this person to do what he's being asked to do. And then it's like, it, it ends with like, it's like the pie charts, like 99% one color and then 1% the other color. And then it says like, no. And then it says, and then the other, the 1% is no, just in a different color. It's, <laughs> and it's just like, it's just like so good so 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 good i have to dig it out for you but yeah i mean it's um it's kind of a nice segue really because after i went through all that um experience i had a dalliance in uh tech and real estate which was kind of interesting um which kind of was going extremely well and and then when the market crashed in 27 20, 2007 2008 went extremely badly but you know this is back in a day when you could buy facebook traffic for you know cents rather than dollars and uh, you know you can just drive huge amounts of traffic but after that i actually started an agency digital agency uh building websites apps you know all kinds of stuff um you know and it was 2008 right like the world and his wife had an idea for an app and some of them were good and some of them were, were terrible and but you know everyone wanted to wanted to build apps and i took that passion for entrepreneurship and the journey that i'd been on and, and, and kind of was was great at um building early stage apps, taking an idea out of someone's head, putting it down onto paper and figuring out what we needed to build. I'd also built a contact of um, kind of investors and, and things like that. So we would help them raise money as well. And, and so it became kind of part agency, part, part incubator, which was kind of really nice because the agency side never really kind of, you know, you just, you, you kind of, you, you were doing something for someone and it was a set fee and the challenge with it all, I'm sure you're supposed to say is like, people's ambition is this big and their budget is this big. Yeah. Uh, no matter how much you tighten the scope of like, we're going to build that. Like they're like, yeah, well now we want to do this, this. I remember uh, 
the building is office flat, like this kind of like web based, like kind of like an early like project management office based system. And like, you know, we, we were trying to build a, you know, we always said like, you know, start small, build features, get clients, understand that whole kind of build measure learn thing. And like, you know, the, what, what this client wanted to do and the first version that's like, like, you know, like this wasn't even in some of the, you know, biggest enterprise platforms that were doing similar same things at the time. And like, we're, we're, uh, we're getting this wrong. So, but I mean, you know, fast forward, we, it was, a, it was a really great experience, but what I found was we built a lot of great technology and we helped get some stuff off the ground. And, um, but it was difficult to always find entrepreneurs that had that grit, right. And that determination, right. Because you, you guys all know this, like you launch stuff and guess what? Like it, it isn't, if you build it, they will come. Like if they, if you build it, they might come and some of them might come back again the next day. And some of them you may never see again, but like you, you're not guaranteed instant success. Um, and good ideas aren't necessarily a proxy to good businesses, right? Like there's, everyone has an idea. The execution is really what matters, right? If you, if you don't execute, um, then it's, it's, it's just an idea. And everyone's always super protective of their idea. Well, this is my idea. What if someone else finds out about it? I'm like, what do you think is going to happen when you launch this? Like the world's going to find out about it. Like at yeah. some point we're going to have to tell some people about this. Um, so yeah. And then, you know, that was a really interesting part of the journey, just kind of seeing all these ideas built and all this tech, but ultimately the, the catalyst to start Vox Pop me was the frustration of building some great tech that never really, um, you know, became what it could be, what it could have been. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is something that um, I, I tell John and Mitch all the time. Like uh, when we, since basically being an entrepreneur, it's like trust your gut. Um, but you know, but John kind of comes in and brings that nice thing into the partnership where he's like the processes, because you know we have to figure out like how are we going to execute that. Like there's that vision, there's that innovation that you have, that idea, but then you've got to develop. Mm -hmm. like, Okay, how are we going to use this? How are people going to use this? And that's kind of where Mitch comes in. Mitch will come in and he'll sit there and go like, yeah, but how's a person going to do that? <laughs> well, it, you know, it's, it's about, I mean, it's like Dave said, I mean, it's great. It's, it's wonderful to have a great idea, but what's the pathway for the user that's going to lead you on a parallel path to success? You have mm -hmm. to have both. Yep. You can't just have your pathway. There's got to be a pathway for the end user, the customer, whatever the case may be, to, to reach success or satisfaction um, and to want to come back. That's the other thing everybody forgets. Visiting visiting once, buying once, experiencing mm -hmm. once is one thing. Repeat business is the foundation of just about any kind of successful venture. So yeah, you have to build a pathway to get there for both as a business, but also simultaneously for your whoever your customer is, whatever that is. In the, at the same time nobody seems to think about those two things yeah that's hard. It's, it's all the idea yeah speaking of idea this is where we're gonna like in and we're just gonna like interrupt here with the brand bid uh because okay. there's been some uh interesting developments uh see last uh the last episode we brought up well john brought up uh harley davidson and making an electric bike with live wire and you probably all know where I'm going with this. If you follow any trends on anything about Ford, the new F-150 Lightning and mm -hmm. what happened there. So, John, I'll let you take I'll over. I'll try to speak over my jackhammer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like you said, <laughs> as is fitting with, uh, with, with the whole auto industry, everybody's pushing ahead with the electric vehicles. And uh, Ford's is interesting because they are, uh, for me, they're one of the first that's kind of sticking to – the the model right uh if you look at tesla they're kind of doing something weird in terms of design trying to stand out make their make their electric trucks look different uh mm -hmm. or just kind of from a branding standpoint they're keeping that design the, the body frame you know all that all that stuff that is ford you know they're keeping it consistent and i think that's that's an interesting differentiation in, in the way that they're going um and then and i know the a lot of the articles are focusing on costs and I don't know, I kind of want to pitch this out to you all. The truck is going to be like 40 grand and they're acting like that's a good price to me. <laughs> Maybe I'm just poor. I don't well, know. But uh, I think anything. if you look at pickup prices, John, especially the, if you move just away from the base model, it's, it's not unusual to find a, you know, 
a well a well equipped decent sized pickup being 50 grand plus out there anymore um i was kind of stunned myself just watching you know watching commercials being an advertising guy i just don't sit there and take take it in for what it is i'm mm-hmm. looking at all the details so i read that little fine print that's at the bottom you know ma- manufacturer suggestion retail price and all that crap mm-hmm. yeah 50 grand 50 grand for a for a decent pickup across the board whether it's dodge chevy whatever yeah uh, Ford. Well, i think they're 50 grand i think that talks to like the change in how like trucks used to be you know very much utility vehicles used by people who needed the utility of a truck and now it's like a lifestyle thing right like you know like i know loads of friends who've got like f-150 raptors and that thing's never seen off-road but they you know <laughs> they drive it around park city and you know you know what i mean it's it's just like it's uh you know it's it's, it's become more of a, a statement or a piece of fashion or whatever you want to call it like an image thing uh, yeah. as much as the utility and yeah i mean it, all of a sudden it's jacked up for it's jacked up the prices for everyone else who you know is a landscaper or whatever and just wants a good a good solid truck that they, they can well, uh, run their business yeah I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm a corvette guy um well i still am a corvette guy but um i always liked you know i've watched over the years the first one i bought i was i was 20 years old it was a 96 and then uh, a couple of years later, I bought, uh, I sold that one, traded it in for another 96, but it had all the options on it, a different color, of course. And then uh, after that, traded for 98. And then my last one that I bought was a 2004. And I bought that one like right before the 2007 crisis. <laughs> Great timing. I do things in excellent timing. Um, and so, but, it, you know, watching like the price of those and how they've gone up, uh, and then looking at the market now, what the used market is, it's like, I don't, I don't know, 40 grand for, for that kind of truck is appealing. I think we all know that once it gets to the car lot, there's another $20,000 that's going to get lobbed onto that um, pretty quickly uh, in some areas. So uh, compared to Tesla, though, I mean, what's the going rate for a Tesla right now? Does anybody know? Uh, the, the truck's going to be 70K because I, I put the... I was, I was, I, I put my hundred dollars down to get in line to buy it maybe a year and a half, two years ago. So we'll see. I don't know where I'm in the queue right now. And, um, given the way our friend Elon's manipulating crypto right now, uh, I may, uh, maybe, maybe buying an F-150, uh, in protest. So, uh, yeah. Well, Chevy, you know, Volt, my friend had Chevy Volt and it was 34 grand. So I think that's what they paid for years ago. So when looking at it, I'm like, hmm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not a bad price for, for what I'm seeing in electric vehicles. And that's, I mean, that's kind of what all the articles and the news are writing home about, that it's kind of revolutionizing access to, to you know, electric vehicles, in particular, the trucks and competing with Tesla, which is obviously the... Yeah, well, they got to make it affordable. I mean, I can't afford a $70,000 vehicle um, no more. And that's kind of like what a co- nice Corvette would go for right now. You know, I mean, the most expensive vet I ever bought was at 2004 and I bought, like I said, I bought that in 2007. So the mileage on that thing had, I think I bought it with 34,000 miles. So, but I had a vehicle already that had pretty much equity in it so that I could do that. Cause I'm not a rich man. So I had, but I had a vehicle that had like 14 grand in equity in it because it was paid off. Right. So I was kind of like, I had 50% of that car paid for. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what the resale value of those cars are going to go for. Um, I know there's a big thing right now, since we're on like innovation and talking about that and entrepreneurship, it's like one of the key things is supportability. Like you're not going to like roll that thing into a car shop on the corner and be like, Hey, (laughs) change the brakes. Right. (laughs) Like, I don't know how far we are into that. Cause I know with Tesla is like, you got certain places you can take it to and that's it. Mm-hmm. And there's that whole fix it yourself movement going on right now as well. Um, I mean, I think I mean, that's come with everything, right? Like we, we, we become a consumption economy, like no one fixes anything anymore. Right. It's like, <laughs> Oh, the washing, the washing machine broke. Let's yeah, buy a new one. A new one. Like, okay. Like that. I mean, growing up, that wasn't the way we, things operated, but you know, now all of a sudden it's like, well, by the time I spent 125 bucks to get the plumber to come out or whatever, and then there's some parts and then he's got to come back. It's like, yeah, it's already four or five years old, as you say. There's some depreciation. You know, it's just yeah, right. everything's become about consumption now. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things that I think that we're going to see where people are going to, because I, I remember even when this recession hit back then that people started holding on to things more like vehicles, you know? And mm -hmm. so now it's like they continue to fix it. I mean, the car that I drive, I'm not ashamed of it. It's a 20 year old Mazda Protege. It's held together with dreams and duct tape, but you know, as long as it's still <laughs> <runs. laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Uh, it's interesting though. It, auto sales is such a core cool part of the U.S. economy, though, right? Like, it, like mm -hmm. cars. You know, the U.S. economy has been built on real estate and automobiles, right? It's just yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's why I look at it, right? It's just get buy a house, get buy a car. Like this is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's the American dream. <laughs> yeah. It's, Speaking it's, of it, is. you're not uh, obviously <laughs> for those listening, they picked up on your accent, and yeah. you told us you're in Utah. Yeah, Southern Utah accent right there. Did you get off? Of the <laughs> what happened? How'd you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just, uh, yeah, no. So yeah, originally from England, uh, grew up in England, moved to the U.S. five years ago. Um, so yeah, as part of the growth of Oxbot Me, we uh, had an opportunity. We had a partnership we set up here, and yeah, came for what was going to be a year, and landed in Salt Lake City because that's where the partner we were working with was, and moved up to park city about three years ago which is you know just outside and in the mountains and a great place to live if you like the outdoors and snowboarding and mountain biking and stuff and yeah just uh just literally got, just got approved for my green card so yeah here to stay and kids are in school and nice. you know happy wife happy life you know it's, uh, <laughs> it's all good it's all congratulations good. thanks man well, we mentioned just now because we kind of got into that topic after right segueing into that talking about Elon uh, Musk and because uh, one of the questions I had was like, who are some entrepreneurs we know and look up to? Um, do you have any others? Is there any others that you guys have? Because Elon is from my generation, Generation X. So I guess that kind of fits, you know. Um, what about you guys? Do you guys have a fave or fan of? I, guess. I, I don't know if there's somebody I'd. I don't know, look up to or try to model or, or anything, but I mean, Walt Disney, when I look at, at what has been created around that, that, uh, that brand, that whole ecosystem, I mean, it's just cultural and so ingrained in, in everything that we do and to the point that we don't realize it. Um, and just, it, it's impressive to me, you know, to both have kind of that physical Disneyland, Disney World experience, also have the films and the studios and all that stuff I, you know those those types of entrepreneurs who have those visions and make them come true to me that's incredible <laughs> the, yeah. doing anything on a global scale you know i mean jason you and i we're sitting here toying with the numbers that we have in in, in this little louisville market <laughs> and you know and it's just unfathomable to me even even a 500 person company i don't know dave you you, you know you got your hands on that uh you know, to grow something that big, to control something across the globe, something like an Amazon or whatever. Mm -hmm. I can't even fathom how you do it, frankly. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. How you how you keep all those pieces working together. together. It, it is fascinating. Yeah, it's uh, I, I think um, I think there's almost a belief like you look at these big companies and you're like, oh, they must have everything figured out. And like the more you talk to people that work in them, it's like it's 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 chaos just on a larger scale. I mean, like, the, 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 you know, it's this uh, key themes they're working towards. And I think some companies do do it better than others. And yeah, you think about like, OK, like your CEO of Google, what does that really mean? Like, how, what are you, you know, like there's, there's so many products, layers and, and, and things like that. And you know, it amazes me like Jack Dorsey, right? He's the CEO of Twitter. Twitter and square i think I, uh, I believe still both of them at the moment i mean like mm -hmm. you know it's incredible it's incredible and yeah you see you know elon love him or hate him you know with what he's doing across you know tesla spacex you know the the hyperloop stuff you know the various other things that he's uh you know in, involved in you know whilst you know he whilst he he's clearly like you know uh, incredible like a, a level of intelligence you know for many of us could only dream of aspiring to there's still only 24 hours in his day and he has to sleep for a few of them All right yeah he still yeah. manages to it just it, it blows me away so for me i'm always impressed by that the entrepreneur that can um manage like have such a big vision yeah if you look at elon steve jobs they're maniacal about the detail 
Right. And it's like, how can you how can you think so big and be all the way up here, yet be, you know, there's all of these stories about jobs losing his shit over like, you know, this tiny, you know, this isn't right or things like that. Yeah. You know, like how do you spam that? Um, and maybe it is that. Maybe they 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 don't do anything in the middle. Everything's either huge vision or, you know, something yeah. like super yeah. specific with it. That's a really good point to bring up. I mean, there are entrepreneurs that they can't go tactical. They kind of they're they're just total strategy. They're total like vision, like very hot level thinking. And when it comes to day to day stuff, the tactical stuff, they're kind of like, I can't do that. I can't get into that. And so there's it's very rare um, to kind of see one that does both and can kind of step in and out like that and and be able to do that. Because let's face it, I mean, Elon is he? You know, we we talk about him like he's incredibly intelligent, but it was less than 10 years ago he was nearly bankrupt and would have been done like literally within an hour <laughs> his world transformed from mm-hmm. epic failure to a phenomenal success and, and he tells it all the time you know with tesla so um it kind of like it kind of goes into that whole thing about being an entrepreneur and taking a risk and willing to invest but you've got to have some some something about you that um, allows you to either do one or the other of those things. And if you can't, then you need to hire and find somebody that can be that other person. Because even with Steve Jobs, without Wozniak, there wouldn't have been no Apple II. Mm-hmm. Uh, and without the Apple II, there would be no, there would not be an Apple today, let's face it. Um, with Elon, I don't know if we know of any of the brains there. Yeah. I think uh, I think what we learned from Saturday Night Live is he hasn't got a career in TV presenting. So we, we kind of <laughs> be pretty sure we can be pretty sure about that. He's crushing pretty much everything else in life, but you know, TV presenting is maybe not his uh, thing. But you know, fair play for him to him for doing it. Yeah, well, that, that, that's the luxury of being an Elon Musk. You can do something like you can step step completely out of your your sphere and do something like Saturday Night Live. It doesn't hurt you. No, it really doesn't. Uh-huh. It kind of helps. Going back to that kind of how he can do both. I mean, I, I watched his episode, one of them on, on Joe Rogan's show, and it's just, and I, I think I mentioned it to, to Mitch. He's like pained about having to, to dumb down <laughs> what he's doing. Uh, but it's incredible that, you know, he just talks so casually about going to Mars and having yeah. this, on Mars. It's just like kind of, it's like in his brain, we're already there. Yeah. Know? Everybody else is just finds it unfathomable that we're anywhere even close. Just, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, he's a different type of character in terms of entrepreneurship, and I think a lot of them are like you know the the guys we talk to, the guys and and gals that we talk about are they're different. They they can do both. If you're going to be a Jeff Bezos or you know Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, you've got to be able to do some level of both. I don't know that you can adequately grow a company of that nature by plugging a hole on on strategy and vision or you know the tactical side you've got to be able to to marry those two things in your brain you 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 have to think you have to think you've always got you've got the main brain elon musk the main brain behind behind tesla and spacex walt disney the main brain some say it's still in a you know in a jar somewhere (laughs) in disney world anyway You've got that main brain, but you've got you've usually got a complementary personality or set of personalities mm. that balance the creative side with, let's say, the logic side, if you will, on a, on a smaller scale, but nevertheless pretty successful. You look at Humana in the early days of Humana. You had David Jones, who was David Jones and Wendell Cherry. Wendell Cherry was the creative thinker. They both came from the law profession, but Wendell Cherry had the vision for where he could take a healthcare company. And it started with, let's marry insurance and hospitals in one corporate entity and, and let's take that somewhere. David Jones was the, was the, was the pragmatist. It's like, okay, I'll help you roadmap that, put the wheels in motion, start putting the parts together to move that. And it became the largest healthcare company in the United States. It, I, just saying that you, you've got to have a creative mind, but you have to have mm-hmm. either somebody who can balance both or there's somebody either behind the scenes or more visible that partners with you that can help. I like what you were talking about before, kind of draw that, draw that map. Okay, ha- this is great. This is a great destination. How do we get there? Right. So, so, I mean, with NerdBrand, with NerdBrand, we've kind of got it. I mean, you've got, you've got Jason who's, who, who 
is kind of the details, the uh, the the, the uh, hmm. strategy. You've got Jonathan, and you've got well, you've got Jonathan, who's 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 the. Uh, uh, I've got to put it into action. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. But you, but you know, but you know how to do that. Yeah. yeah well, I think John and I. So you need that balance of creativity and practicality. Yeah, John and I are both. I mean, I guess if you really want to strip it down, John and I are both visionaries in that we both had an idea to do something. Uh, tactically, John knows how to apply that strategy-wise and and long-term and all that. I think he knows and trusts me to kind of like this is the path to kind of tie the dots together to get there. Like he knows the dots, but I'm the one that's like, well, that connects, not that one. That one comes first, not that one. Mm -hmm. And so I've been able to do that really well over my career, um, especially when it comes to hiring. Cause I, I, Dave, I like to hear your opinion like that. Cause I know that you're only as good as your team. So I'm kind of curious, like when you get to the level that you're at, um, how important was it to kind of focus on the team and the people that you brought in to your organization and how they fit and how you determine that? I know it's kind of a broad question. Yeah, that's great. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, and I'll just kind of loop it back into kind of what you, you all just was just saying. Um, a really good book that I read recently is called uh, Traction. Uh, and it talks about the entrepreneur's operating system. Uh, it's a really good book in terms of, you know, the way you can approach your business, how you structure certain things, recommend anybody, you know, you, you guys should definitely read it. You'd, I think you'd love it. Um, but the thing there, it talks about having a visionary and it talks about having an integrator and that's the top of the org. You know, you have to have, you have to have both. And yeah, you're right. Some people can be visionary and integrator at the same time. Um, if you, if you rare rare people i would definitely say i lean more to the visionary side and less you know less to the detail which kind of links to the hiring question you know you've got to really acknowledge like what am i good at and what do i enjoy and that is where you should be like that's your zone of excellence right you're you're, you're great at it and you enjoy it like you need to spend 90 percent of your time there and it's like yeah i you know i literally have a four box grid like what do I enjoy this? What do I not like? What am I terrible at? What am I thing? And I move those things and anything that's in the bottom of the left, you know, I outsource. So, you know, there's some things that if I enjoy and I'm not very good at it, playing the guitar would be a great example. You know, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to try and move into the, the top right box. But if I don't enjoy it and I'm not very good at it, like it's not going to give me energy. And we only have so much energy each day. So for me, it's been about figuring out where my um weaknesses and deficiencies are um and that's not just in capability it's in thinking right but, you know you need um diversity of thought mm -hmm. like if everybody in the company thought about the world the way i did man it'd be a disaster like <laughs> and that's not to, and it's not that i think about it wrong but like i am you know eternally optimistic about everything think everything can be done in you know a week you know it's just like you know just we'll, we'll work faster we'll work harder we'll get it done um you know um which is great but sometimes like you run so fast as an entrepreneur you don't bring the rest of the team with you right so you like if you leave everybody behind all of a sudden you know like you know what do they say if you want to go far go together if you want to go fast go alone well when you're building a company you can't afford to go alone there's too much complexity there's too much you need to do mm -hmm. which means you can't always go as as fast as you want yeah you can send out a scout team that can go super fast to work on a side project or whatever that might be but you've got to go at a pace that brings everybody together, you know, and if you, you know, clearly if you're climbing a mountain, you know, you need to make sure that you've got people that can get to the top of the mountain, that they're capable of keeping a pace where we're not all going to die because it takes us, you know, five hours to get up to the, up to the summit and when we're in the death zone, you know what I mean? It's, you just got to really think about that. So I'm, I'm really looking for um, hiring is, you know, that, a bringing in some of that diversity and we do a lot of profiling. We test um, people, we under, understand, you know, where they fit within the matrix, how are they going to um, fit into the team that we're bringing them into? Are they additive to it? They're going to be disruptive and, you know, are they going to disrupt in a positive way, which kind of rounds out the team or are they going to be, you know, are they going to slow things down and stuff? So yeah, we rely a lot on that kind of um, the science of that type of stuff to kind of identify and, and build out. And it's not, whilst it's not always, you know, perfect, it's pretty good. Like most of the time people like read the, through the reports are like, yeah, this is me. Maybe I disagree with that. And often when they disagree, it's like, 
Yeah, I disagree with that. It's like, are you disagreeing because it's not you or are you disagreeing because you're embarrassed and you don't like the fact that, you know, you got a two for teamwork or whatever it might be. So, <laughs> uh, you know, like it's, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I love building teams and, you know, trying to get the most out of people. That's been one of the highlights of being an entrepreneur is seeing people who joined, you know, the first people who joined the company, maybe straight out of college, like, you know, progress to leading product, leading this and, you know, how they've, you know, been able to grow their, their career uh, within Vox for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing that I like. I mean, as an entrepreneur, it's like it's not just growing the company and the client base or whatever. It's the team. You know, I, I like I like fitting pieces in that make make the whole thing work for everybody. Um, and so the team is so important in the hiring decisions. And you brought up like what you're good at when you're not good at. Yeah, recognizing limits in our industry it's quite easy. And of course, you had an agency, so you know the amount. Of, there's only so many hats a person can wear. And if you keep throwing a hat on that person, I mean, eventually it's just going to, it's going to lead to a collapse and something, you know, uh, exhaustion, burnout, whatever you want to call it. So, I mean, I, I've done a lot of different things within an agency, a lot of different types of jobs, but stepping out, I've, I've stepped out of like the web design part because we've got a web designer. Why do I need to be over there for that? You know, um, mm -hmm. You know, John and Mitch in, in, in the realm of, of copy and proofing and creative, uh, using even Laura as part of creative as our web designer. And, and you know, so I'm not sitting around all day making like a design. I'm not my Photoshop. I think the last time I opened it up was last month, you know, so there's not, there, you know, you knowing your knowing your limits. And then as far as weaknesses, I read a book a while back. I think it was I think it was called Strength Finder. But, you know, your weakness is your weakness. It's never going to be a strength. Now that's like you said, that doesn't mean that you don't work on certain things because if you're weak in math, you don't just not do math. You're going to figure that out pretty quickly. The moment you start making money that you need to figure out how to balance a checkbook. Um, that probably shows my age right there. Cause many people are like <laughs> balance a what? <laughs> what's, a, what's a checkbook? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> yeah but how I mean, you balance a debit yeah. card. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, yeah, you have to like <clears throat> know your limits because you start getting into areas that you're not good at, you're going to, like, I could become the disruption very quickly, mm -hmm. you know, if I start getting into areas that I have other people that are doing those things. Um, well, there's, you know, there's a practical aspect to it, Jason, too, I think, and we've talked about this before, and, and it, it's, it's a principle in advertising. If you design an ad, the more things you're going to ask that ad to accomplish, the fewer things it's going to accomplish well. It's the same thing yep. with people. The more things, the more things you expect them, the more different things you expect them to do, the fewer of those things they're going to be able to do particularly well. Now we live in an age, we all know this, the, the, the digital age we live in, in our industry especially, it, it's become very common to ask someone to be a graphic designer, a web designer, a social media uh, expert, uh, a copyright, because everything comes from this same machine, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. People tend to think if you know how to work the machine, you can do all of the things. And we all, I mean, I think we all pretty much agree that's not. <laughs> I just saw Dave's you guys know me. It's golf balls. Yeah. I think there's a story there. You understand, though. I mean, I get it. it though. Like golf ball, golf clubs. You got the right club for the right shot, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 increasingly important, I think, to stay in focus that just because everything comes from the same kind of mechanism, not everybody can get the same quality of product or service out of that mechanism mechanism as the next guy. You need to have people that know how to do particular things particularly well. I think your point on is is absolutely spot on and, and nowhere is that more apparent than the digital world, right? Like you think about the evolution in digital over the last 20 years. And as you say, you know, like you build these, you know, websites with static tables and not really great design. And, and now let's look like there's so much specialism, um, you know, everything, you know, there's, you know, a niche within a niche. Okay. I'm a social media expert. Okay. What does that really mean? Paid social, organic social, Snapchat, like a particular platform, like mm -hmm. how to be successful on TikTok is completely different to a Twitter strategy. So and I get it. Like, in, you know, when you think about an organizational structure, you know, when there's four of you, like you have to wear a bunch of hats and then you're, you basically, as you grow, figure out, okay, like, 
this hat is becoming a, a pretty heavy hat. I need to find someone who who's capable of wearing that and just have, having that. And, you know, it's, you know, in those early days, you have to hustle up and, you know, and, and be able to do this. But it, it, as you say, it's just, um, I think your, your analogy of like, well, it all comes from the same machine is, is, is right. Well, oh, you know, I remember like, you know, doing stuff and it's like, oh, you know, like my family would be like, well, Dave, Dave does this on the internet. He can fix this machine. It's like, I don't like no, you know, I don't work with like when your window, you know what I mean? It's just like, okay, just because you know technology, why do you think I'm going to be able to fragment your hard drive or whatever? And yeah, I'd probably figure it out <laughs> more than them, but you know what I mean? Right. It's just like you became in the early days, you became the technology guy in the family and it's like, Oh, great. So now I'm having to just set up your phone just because I build websites. So, all right, I'll do it. But you know what I mean? Yeah, I wash, I wash windows. Uh, and somebody comes and says, oh, you wash windows. Cool. Build me a house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Kind of, kind of dialing back to like the, you know, entrepreneurs that we look at, kind of what are the good traits of, of an entrepreneur? Why, why are some successful, some aren't? Uh, and I was reading Good to Great and, uh, that's a that's a great, great book. book. Well, I'm not not really through it yet at the moment, but um, you know one of the qualities, and I think it's I think I saw the quote in that book. It was that you can accomplish anything if you don't care who gets credit, and I think that's mm -hmm. a, a a trait of probably every you know most major entrepreneurs that you kind of see in the headlines. I think they you know even if they have a little bit of an ego, even if they have a little bit of a you know attitude uh, that is not necessarily pleasurable at the same time when it comes down to the work they just want to create something they don't care who who gets credit at the end of the day um maybe that's because their name's going to be on it by default i don't know <laughs> but, uh, I, I yeah, think, I, uh, that's a that's something that i try to you know stay away from the ego stay away from being right being the the person in the room who's correct and just get to the answer right whoever that comes up with that answer who cares it's about solving the problem yeah i love the phrase your ego is not your amigo um <laughs> it's just you know it's just like you know it, you're right like the best don't care about that and, and i think the the other thing i would say is the other most important factor is like a grit factor um like you just figure it out like the best entrepreneurs like that, like I guess, like I get most energy from like, hey, bring me a problem. Like I love solving problems, and I love figuring stuff out. So like that is what I, I want to do. And it's like, and that's kind of nice as the team's grown and the company's grown. The challenges get bigger and different. But I know when someone like, like when someone brings me a problem, like they're bringing it to me because they haven't been able to figure it out. It's 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 a major problem, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be bringing it to me. So like that. That's uh, you know a great part of it. So I think kind of you know, that grit and determination uh, combined with that humility of of being able to say it's not about me getting the credit; it's about us achieving our objectives. Is is the kind of perfect perfect formula? Yeah. Well, that's kind of like a web developer in you. I mean, and, and any I mean that's kind of what we do. We're problem solvers. If somebody brings us a problem, mm -hmm. we have to figure it out because in web there's such a diversity of just languages and things that come up and sometimes when you write code it loads fine and then you go back two more times and load it up again and it doesn't load and there's something broken so you're constantly looking and debugging and trying to figure out what happened and so you're mm -hmm. always with problems constantly either on the, the you know minimal level or max level so it's sort of like a part of that um because in engineering when i was doing that years ago it was like I had a supervisor like, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions, because we always know what the problem is, you know? Like, you can physically look at the object and go, that broke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in our world, there's no, like, piece of steel or metal or actuator or whatever that is broken. Like, you may not know that it's broken, but it's there, you know, sometimes. Um, I used to run, uh, oh, gosh, it was called New Relic on uh, servers and stuff and look at that and i could see like there's a problem but on the site nobody would know because the page load and they're interacting with the content forms work everybody's happy but i'm looking mm -hmm. at that like that script that's a problem because it keeps going burp, <laughs> keeps burping yeah <laughs> so, yeah um that's kind of where i was going with that but yeah we're just problem solvers and we know how to look for them uh, and so i think the, the key there is like how do you solve that problem? And it's like a little bit like development, right? 
there's a million ways you can write that code to solve that problem. But, mm -hmm. you know, like how big is the problem? It, you know, what does this piece of code need to do in two years time? Do I have two hours to fix this or a week to fix it and build it? Because right. again, like the, to be truly great, you have to understand like, what is, how do I need to fix this problem now? And then like, what, you know, because A, you don't want to build a, a bunch of technical debt in, but you also don't want to spend so long on it that, you know, you over engineer the problem. It's like, yeah. I need to get from A to B and, you know, like, and it's over a small little r river, right? Okay, well, I can just get us a big plank of wood and we can all step over the river. Great, it works. It does the job. It, it achieves the objective, you know, like, again, just understanding like what the objective is and then fixing the problem based on, on that. I think is key because so many times either things get hacked together too quickly because someone hasn't had the foresight to think about where this is going in the future or probably what's worse than that is the over over engineering of a problem that actually just you know could have been solved relatively simply as a v uh, as a v1 mm -hmm. yeah and then there is always that joke about comments that are like you know to do improve this and it's like six years ago that that comment was in the code and uh, it never gets improved <laughs> but story for a different day yeah, I, well, and that happens with, you know, we get customers or with, they get a website, they get a, they get a commercial WordPress theme and they'll hire an agency or somebody and, you know, in WordPress, you make a child theme and then that child theme overrides the styles of the, the parent and then adds function, if it has a function file, adds function to the parent theme to be for the listeners out there. They're like, what the crap are y'all talking about? Um, but quite often they do that right but you're still dependent upon that parent theme and it's always over engineered because it needs to fit a market for a be all to all type of solution you know for what they're trying to do and i've come across uh there's been a couple of examples where john and i've come across some folks that have approached us where they just have a landing page and it's this big giant commercial theme and i'm like you just need a landing page like it's one page you don't need this mm -hmm. massive solution that's sitting behind it in order to do that so yeah, and and I've I've come across quite often like the lack of future proofing, as I call it. You know that mm -hmm. like, I'm gonna write this code and I'm gonna do this. I've had a lot of developers write pages of CSS and they'll come to me and they're like, I can't get this object to move around. And then I write like five lines of code and they just look at me like you're a wizard. And I'm like, that ah, just comes with experience because I did that once. I wrote pages of code and oh, it's just these three selectors and that's it. <laughs> Problems. <Yeah. laughs> You know, uh, that comes from a lack of collaboration with other people. You know, as developers, we typically want to be the problem solver and then kind of getting back to that ego thing. We kind of want to win the day. We want to win the argument with ourselves or with the code. And mm -hmm. we, we end up because we didn't get somebody else involved to take a look at it with fresh eyes. We actually created a monster in what I call Franken code, where you're just mm -hmm. constantly adding to it. And this thing's just dragging on, trying to load and it's a mess for everybody now and it's your fault. <laughs> There's that with branding too. I mean, kind of going higher level beyond the development stuff, uh, this tendency to either mishmash things together without really thinking of the future or this tendency to get held up thinking I've got to solve every, every customer problem, every branding problem right now, or things aren't going to work. I mean, you know, we I talked with a client yesterday who has a very simple problem. <laughs> they have customers their their customers are price sensitive and they're choosing competitors over them and and there's not a clear message of why you know that the customer should choose them versus going to the lower priced item because in their mm -hmm. mind the customer in the customer's mind and perception is reality for the same price or for a lower price they're getting the same outcome um, mm -hmm. and it's just like you literally just need a, a you need a brand awareness campaign that is focused on why you're different and that's it and i think <laughs> you know they get caught up thinking what does that look like what does that mean where are we going to put that what channels are we going to be in how do we reach our our target all that stuff and it's just like no you just need to settle on first this is the message and yes it seems super elementary and stupidly simple but that's what you're telling you know if your research is correct if your data on the customer is correct you know the answer seems pretty obvious in that scenario and it's like don't overthink it because then you don't get the job done. I think where, where you were going, Dave, is like you can future proof something so well that you don't get from A to B, you don't get over the river. Um, 
everything doesn't have to be the Golden Gate Bridge, so, so to speak. <laughs> it can just be yeah. a piece of wood or a log can, or whatever. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. it's the simplest solution that gets the problem. It's like somebody told me a while back, it's like, it's uh, simply profound and profoundly simple. And uh, sometimes you kind of work your way into that because, and that's why it's like, I always tell uh, like a, a developer that like, if I see them for 30 minutes working on something and they ain't got it figured out, like, I don't care if they ask me, but for 30 minutes, walk away for a minute, take a walk, walk the dog, go get lunch, mm -hmm. do something else, stare at a painting. I don't care. Just <laughs> stop looking at your editor and your machine and go, go away and then come back in about 10, 15 minutes or whatever. And you're going to go like, well, I'll be darned. There's the answer. It was in front of me. And it's just this one little thing. It happens all the time because we get like tunnel vision, you know, and, and I think that happens with our businesses when we, we tend to like get too focused on the small things and we miss like it's that force for the trees saying, mm -hmm. you know, I think that happens quite a lot because whether you're developing and writing code or if you're developing a business, it, it's sort of the same kind of problems in, in some way uh, and handling them sometimes is just change your perception, change your perspective. I mean, um, so there's that. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, Dave, we've loved having you on the show, man. I, you know, I kind of like wrapping up here at the end. Um, I let people know where they can find you and follow you on, whether they be Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Let the people know where they can. Yeah, find you. yeah, for sure. Uh, so yeah, just uh, Dave uh, at Dave Carruthers on Twitter. Um, uh, Dave search Dave Carruthers and Voxbot Me on LinkedIn, and yeah, the website's uh, just voxbotme.com if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, my company and, and and what we do. But this has been great. It's been great to uh, to chat with you all today, and uh, love the format a lot more conversational, uh, as you say. And um, yeah, it's uh, it was great to uh, to be a part of the episode today. Yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd, before we cut off, I'd, I mean, I'd. If you're open to it, I'd like to hear a little more description of Voxpot Me. I think people would be yep. interested. Me too. Uh, I know you guys work with plenty of big name brands. Yeah, and small, for sure. Small e-commerce sites that we work with are are the types that can make really good use of this and user generated content and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. so, it's, well, yeah, yeah. It's selfish. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, you're asking me to talk about my company. I'm like, yeah, there we go. Um, it's uh, always happy to do that. But yeah, yeah, no, Voxbot Me, we're a video survey platform. So what that means is we help um, brands large and small. Majority of our clients are actually kind of Fortune 1000 customers. So it's like the Microsofts, eBay's, and uh, Verizon's, the Agios, AB and Bev's of the world. But, uh, you know, we can work with, with anybody and, and really just help them get closer to the customer if you think about kind of where we you know where traditional surveys sat you know very much kind of tick boxes gave you a lot of the what didn't really give you much of the why uh and in this day and age you really need to understand your customer to your point about the client with the pricing challenges what do, what is the outcome the customer is actually looking for what is what does a premium offering look like sound like you know what what is what is the problem they're trying to solve and the, real, the way we believe you do that is continuous customer conversations and you know historically maybe you'd have done that traditionally with like a focus group or customer interviews but and they're slow and they're expensive and they take a, a whole bunch of time and you know in today's world we need to iterate quicker so we built a platform where you can launch a video survey push it out to our audience your audience um, and really get rich feedback from customers um, through these short kind of 90 second selfie videos where they're answering the, the questions that are most important to you and they just tell you so much more and it, it just brings to life what challenges they're going through and and you know just just we've changed the way that so many companies now are doing customer research and you know we venture back we raised 23 million dollars and um you know scaled scaled from the uk to the us and and, and growing you know super fast so it's been a been an incredible journey as an entrepreneur this is this is by the far i guess uh what's defined my career to date and I'm kind of proud of what the team have been able to build um, and, and, and the growth I've seen. So yeah, I, I get to turn up for work every day and do something I love and, you know, not everybody can say that. Right. Sure. Sure. I, I think the, the beauty, Dave, of, of the product you offer is that it takes advantage of the value of the one-on-one -on -one sort of conversation. And you talk about mm -hmm. focus groups. I mean, to me, the, the downside of focus groups is you've got people in a room, but they're hearing each other. And you're not going to yeah, tell me those. In, you're not going to tell me those people aren't influenced by what they're hearing from the other people around them. Okay, 
Yeah. Malcolm Gladwell gave a great speech on focus groups and why they're not good a long time ago, but I won't get into that. But, uh, but I, that's what I love. The beauty of what you, what you offer is this ability to, to really have a comfort, to really interact with a person one-on-one. -on -one. And I think you probably get more forthcoming information that way. And the, we preach the value of video constantly around here. So and putting that, you know, having a visual interaction with people is, is incredible and doing it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I think is, is just incredible. Yeah. And what it, I mean, what it, the video, the video, when, when the results are shared with stakeholders across the business, they're just so much more engaging when they see it's impactful to see the customer talk. And then, you know, what we've been able to do with that asynchronous nature of the product is to make it scalable, right? Like if you're, you know, we're doing work at the moment with Microsoft and you know, they're trying to, they want to talk to key IT decision makers, people making cloud decisions, like trying to get them on the phone and say, or, or Zoom, even for half an hour and say, hey, you want to answer all these questions. But with, with our tech, we can just push out a quick video survey. They can, you know, answer the questions at their own leisure. And so that async, you know, the world's, the world's really becoming asynchronous in nature for a lot of things. So yeah, we kind of leaned on that uprising trend of video and, and the, the power of asynchronous communication. What's what's the easiest way for people to get started with you? Is there a demo? Is it? Yeah, you can, if you go onto the site, you can give it a spin for free. Um, just go to voxbotme.com and you can find out a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a great way to to connect with customers and find out what your your target audience is is thinking. So we have we have people test ads, test new concept, pricing, competitor analysis. You know, understanding jobs to be done. Like there's so many different ways. Like. Um, you know, businesses need to understand, you know, every, every touch point along the journey and, you know, what, what, what people are considering. So, you know, I think, um, you know, when we think about most companies, particularly in the early stage entrepreneurs, like they get an idea in their head and they skip over doing any research or, or they ask their, their mum, well, your mum's never going to tell you you had a bad <laughs> idea, right? Like she's your mum. I mean, like, although occasionally my mum's told me about some of my bad ideas, but you get what I mean. You know, you have yeah. friends and family, right? So yeah. your friend, you can't, you know, friends and family aren't really going to want to discourage you. They're going to tell you what you want to hear a lot of the time and things like that. Um, so yeah, you just got to, you got to get out there and you got to listen to people and, and try and connect with people. And because you'll, you'll shortcut a bunch of investment. You spend a, you, you you waste a bunch of money building stuff no one wants, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the problem you're trying to solve, you know, so many people rush, let's start building. How about understanding first? And right. then we can build some stuff and then we can build the right stuff and it'll work quicker. Um, because yeah. So I think that's where what I would say is like, you know, you've got to put customer understanding at the heart. Like we have an abundance of choice now as consumers as to where we spend our money, what products and services we use. If you're not taking the time to understand um you, you, you're missing the point mm -hmm. i just saw mm -hmm. a great quote on twitter right before we jumped on here it was stop trying to become an expert in your product become an expert in the customer and yeah the product's gonna follow i mean if you understand what people want and how they want it it's pretty you know from there it's just logistics so yeah. it's awesome I, I'm, I plan on checking it out like i said we've got a couple e-commerce clients that i think would benefit greatly from user generated content and then Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's all kinds of research and and informational stuff that could be gain, gained from that. So it's a cool product. I like it. Yeah, thanks. Obviously, uh, obviously, other people do too. <laughs> 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 well, if uh, if you're listening out there, uh, we we will put all the links and the information for this in the description on our YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out. Uh, go to YouTube, like and subscribe to Nerd Brand and this video so that we can get that coveted vanity earl that we want. Uh, <laughs> other places. Because we're vain. Uh, yes, because we are so vain. Uh, and then you can find us at Nerd Brand Agency everywhere else Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all of that. And you can check us out and watch this episode Friday, 11 a.m. Every week we put out a new podcast. Go to nerdbrandagency.com slash podcast. Check it out, watch it, or listen to it. It's up to you. You do you. Um, you'll find us on Spotify, Google, and iTunes. So we're on a few others. John reminds me every week. I found another one you need to update. Yesterday it was SoundCloud. I forgot <laughs> that we were on SoundCloud. So <laughs> we only have one episode, though. <laughs> so We're on all of the things. Yes. All of the all things with all of the stuff. Yeah, all <laughs> of the things with all of the stuff. Well, 
you could you could get like for people out there to like yeah well, you guys do podcasting like how does that go it's not glamorous it's grueling but you know there's other there's services out there that'll do that auto syndication stuff be very careful mm-hmm. of that it sounds really cool it's really not because you don't really have a lot of control on how that content is presented once it gets posted so we spend a lot mm. of time like posting a certain way on youtube certain way yep. on the audio channels so you know so that's why you can either listen to this or watch and you can see us uh see our faces and enjoy that so exactly. so we do, we do we've done some cool stuff with uh with our podcast uh real talk um where we basically do it as a podcast slash live stream mm-hmm. and then out of the live stream and podcast we turn that into a full article um not just a transcript like an article written basically with snippets out of the the thing and then we use some of those snippets as well for social content so basically start every week it starts with the live stream and then every live stream is targeted at a specific keyword uh and then it goes from there so it's yeah it's been really great uh big kudos to christoph our content strategist he's uh he's crushing it right now Sure. Okay, yeah. that, that sounded kind of that's i thought i was hearing christoph in the background when you were saying that that was interesting yeah yeah exactly exactly <laughs> yeah we did that with ours for a while we do have a because we've been through now a year of episodes so we've got like an archive page basically mm-hmm. with, uh, some of those that are in post with the series that we put together so those are still active on our website yes if you go to our website it is a new site it is different ta-da <laughs> 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 but we do everything iterative here as well so you know keep your not keep an eye on that for some changes and updates but uh yeah check us out nerdbrandagency.com slash podcast watch us so like subscribe find dave you know follow him check out his product it's great it's a great company and uh remember everybody keep your nerd brand strong <laughs>